no one's going to have to compete with uh, your other brain right now, the one that's your stomach, but we'll see if I can uh, do that. Uh, this talk is called Bionic Reality, Combining VR with Biometrics. Um, so I come from a lot of a, a big movement background, martial arts, dance, cognitive neuroscience, and what I'm doing in the set right now is together with MEP, uh, we're trying to be the bridge between uh, science and design uh, when it comes to VR, because when we look at most of what's out there, we feel that people still don't understand uh, how to use this technology well. Um, and talk to me more if that's of interest to you. So, I always like to start with a definition so we're on the same page. Bionic, having normal biological capability or performance enhanced by electronic or electromechanical devices. So we're not going to be focused on the mechanical devices, we're going to be focused on what we can do with VR plus biosensors. And you know, the, the normal quotations are, are because um, statistically, all of us are somewhere under their normal curve. Some of us are just more out there, which is great. Um, so usually I give a bit more of an introduction about brains, but it's a really short lecture, but I still think you need to know a little bit about how this tech works to actually uh, get some valuable data. VR is not just about the eyes. It's not about putting screens in front of your face. Um, VR activates higher levels of your brain because it integrates multi-sensory information. It integrates your visual perception together with your proprioception, the knowledge of where your body is, with audio, and we'll see even uh, more possibilities. And what's important about this tech is uh, the ability to control what your brain has already learned versus new information. So I can start combining your sensory inputs in ways that they haven't been combined before. And by doing that, I can increase your prediction error. I can give you your brain surprising experiences and cause your brain to remodel and actually induce plasticity. Uh, and that's why I like to say that VR allows us to be someone else, but even something else. So we can go beyond these uh, limitations of our physical bodies. And I do want to talk to you a little bit about what is this self-being. We all woke up this morning, afternoon, maybe last night, depends when you went to bed. Um, and we sort of take it for granted that there's a continuity and we are the same sort of thing. But how does your brain actually know what is you versus what is another person, what is a table? So this is a very interesting uh, thing for brains. And once again, our statistics is at play. Uh, your brain combines these different information streams that are coming together. And sometimes the best explanation for these uh, information is just that it's coming from one source, this self-organism. And it's very easy to trick. Uh, how many of you have heard of the rubber hand experiment? Okay, so um, it's a very, very famous experiment in uh, cognitive neuroscience. You take a rubber hand, like you see in the picture, the person's hand is beyond the barrier. You stimulate the rubber hand at the same time as you stimulate the person's real hand. But he only sees the rubber hand. And then you take a, a, a big hammer, you come to smash, smash the rubber hand, and you see how that, brain's, uh, that person has become totally identified with that rubber hand just because his visual perception and his uh, heptic sensation of being uh, touched were correlated in the way that the brain is used to. So it's very easy to manipulate the sense of self. When we wear clothing, when we use tools, they all become part of our sense of self. And, we, and with VR, we can start manipulating this by playing with the bio data that we give you back, by playing with these feedback loops that are really important for the brain. So one of the easiest things that we can do right now is start giving you Proprioception data. Proprioception is, is how your body knows where it is in space. We have all these sensors in it, uh, but when we're using VR, we can use cameras, we can use um, the touch sensors that, uh, you know, like the ocular server controllers that give you the, the data, um, and we'll see also some other mechanisms. And I want to show you a few possibilities that you can do, because you don't have to show people just their usual data. You can do really interesting things once you control the environment with VR. So one of these uh, latest um, experiments um, is called Paint With Me, where you see a combination of a 360, actually a VR video from a first person professional painter, 
and you see your hand overlaid over the um, artist's hands, and you can draw together with the artist while you hear her voice describing uh, what she's doing. Uh, this was shown to really uh, induce this empathetic feeling with this artist, and people knew about the artist more after they did this. Now, they didn't actually test uh, skill acquisition, which is what I'm uh, really, really interested in. Can we actually learn uh, skills by being in first-person views of people who know these skills? So I was trying to test this out. This was part of my um, thesis. Uh, and I tried to get people to do a square in one hand and a circle in another, which is very hard unless you're professional drummers. Um, so I put them in an avatar that knew how to do this, because I could program the avatar to do anything. What do you think? Did they do better or worse when, when they were doing this? Who thinks they did better? Okay. Who thinks they did worse? Okay, nice. So there's a majority for better, and that was my intuition. But actually, people did worse. They all thought they did better. If you asked them, they said yes, it was easier. We felt, you know, we were doing it from inside this body, we could follow. But actually, they did worse. And once again, we can start thinking what's happening in the brain when you're combining these two different information streams. They're getting the visual perception of showing that they're doing great, but their proprioception isn't really fitting what they're seeing, right? So it turns out that at least most people, what happens in their brain, the brain decides, oh, let's believe the eyes and maybe not listen so much to the proprioception. So you can start sort of thinking how these information stream, streams are really important um, for things. And we'll see why this can actually be good maybe um, for pain management, if you have time then. Uh, but you can go do really a lot more crazy things. For instance, what I did here is I gave people opposite feedback. So when they move their right hand, they saw their left hand moving. When they move their left hand, they saw their right hand moving. And under this condition, they were actually a little bit better at mirroring uh, another avatar that was teaching them how to do these movements. So sometimes when you really make things weird for the brain, again, it induces plasticity. Your brain turn in, turns into a more childlike state again and has to relearn a lot more. Um, and you can do really interesting things with these uh, uh, um, biophysics data. Here in this uh, experiment, they took people's hip movements and related it to a tail. Okay, and this tail very fast became a functional tail. People were doing better in this game that they invented by using this extra tail that they had. So you can just start to think how this can augment us and how we can start just doing even daily tasks with extra body parts that are uh, controlled by these movements that we don't usually use. Um, and a lot of what we're doing uh, with virtual bikes, we're coming out with these little demos that some of them you can try tonight that do that. So you can put yourself in a wing creature and fly. You can play back your own movements and interact with them from a different angle. Um, you can combine your movements with the movements of a professional dancer. And uh, in Mind Mover, you can build this whole architectural reality. And when you move, that whole reality moves with you. So again, I'm just taking this very regular biophysical proprioceptive data, location and rotations in space, and doing really weird things with them to give your brain novelty. Um, we can also start looking at users' voices, and the last lecture actually talked about that a bit, and I really think that's uh, underutilized currently in uh, VR. Um, a great um, little app or that's out there is called SoundSell, and what they do is they combine your voice with visuals. So based on the way you're sort of singing and humming, you're going to get all these crazy visuals inducing a synesthetic effect, and they're using this for meditation. Uh, what we did in virtual vibes is something that's called Speak Up, uh, where you can um, sort of train yourself uh, um, and how to speak up against uh, uh, these giant monsters by sort of saying stop very loud and clear. Um, and we're actually using the Microsoft uh, SDK for Unity, which is very easy to use, so that was, that was great. Um, other ways we can get the same type of information is using EMG. EMG is the electrical uh, data that we pick up from your skeleton muscles. So there's been some uh, interesting developments in this. Uh, one of them is a, a Mayo bracelet that you can sort of use the user interface of your fingers and hands uh, for that, um, which I'm not that excited about. I think the Leap Motion does a lot better job of actually seeing your fingers and, and movement. But what is interesting is combining this, what the uh, MTech are doing, they're combining this inside of headsets. And this is interesting because at least for a while, uh, we're still gonna be wearing these semi-bulky headsets. 
And with them, it's actually very hard to get facial recognition. So it's very hard um, to see if you're smiling or moving unless you use actual um, mus skeletal muscle data, um, which can let you embody an avatar uh, that's more accurate, can let you control other things just like we did with our body but with your face. Um, so this, this might be very interesting. Other biophysical data uh, that's starting to be combined in VR is eye tracking. Now again, this can really help with creating very natural user interfaces. Right now, everything's still a bit bulky. You have to, some of these user interfaces that do use eye tracking, you have to sort of move your head. Um, and we can think of other uh, ways that eye tracking can be useful for that. You can make an avatar that's actually correlated to your blinks, and yeah, that's really great too. And of course, from the other side, when you're developing these apps and actually starting to learn about how this affects your brain, you can really track a person's attention uh, and sort of know what, what is interesting to them. So out there right now, um, there's uh, this headset called the Foam uh, that's coming out soon. And, and it's going to be very useful also for uh, developers because you can only render things that people are actually looking at. Why would I waste all this computing power on something that you know the user isn't even looking at right now? Um, and there's also um, Toby Tech that's sort of doing combining this with uh, uh, universities and then experimental stuff and other headsets. Okay, let's move on. Uh, heart rate and skin conducting and breathing. So these are uh, three different things, but they sort of give us the same information. They give us uh, uh, excitement uh, versus calmness, more or less, right? Engagement. Um, things like that. And you can see these two companies that are already doing things with it. The Juno VR is a breath sort of sensor that picks up your breathing. Um, and the Pravada picks up your heart uh, rate data uses or so. Uh, the Apple Watch is, you know, giving you all this um, data about your heart rate. Um, and this is really very useful if you want to start thinking about meditative states, if you want to think about these biofeedback um, and, and really changing our states of consciousness by getting feedback of our heart rate. And again, we can start doing interesting things with this. We don't just have to combine it in a usual way. We can start, for instance, if I'm in a conversation, a virtual date with someone, how about I get to hear his heart rate and he gets to hear mine, right? So you can start thinking about how this will like, affect our social uh, interactions too. And really augmenting our yeah, just our daily interactions by getting data about the other person as well as data about ourselves. Okay, temperature. So does anybody know who this uh, person is? Yeah, Wim Hof, great. So I've been following him for a while now. Um, he was actually, the research on him was done in my university at Thunders, so um, it's very legit. This guy is a supreme. Okay, he can control his body in ways that I cannot, probably you either. Um, but maybe we can, right? And maybe uh, using these uh, biofeedback systems, getting our temperature measurement and connecting it with weird visuals might help us do it. For instance, how about if I'm in a really cold environment, but I'm seeing a hot environment? Which of these things will my brain believe in? We saw how strong this visual perception is, right? It made people believe that they were doing these movements. Can it make people feel that they're really influenced their, their body temperature? So that's a really ex interesting experiment I would love to do at some point. Um, now we're getting to the EEG thing, okay? So I, I, we might have a discussion about this, but uh, I would like to give you a little bit, like 30 seconds about what EEG is actually measuring because you see all these things out there in free waves. It's so cool, it's so cool. But what are we actually measuring? So I have this picture of a, a neuron. And it's a pyramid neuron, okay? Because EEG does not measure all the neurons in your brains. EEG only measures neurons that are aligned in a way that these sensors can pick up, okay? We're talking about the laws of physics here. Um, it only picks up these neurons that are synchronized and firing together. And it only is picking up information uh, from the postsynaptic uh, activity. So, how much of your brain activity is that? Good luck in getting anyone to tell you that information. I was going around my whole master's degree asking everybody I found, so how much are we measuring? How much, is it 10%, is it 1%, is it 90%? Depends, was the best answer I could get. Depends where your sensors are, depends what type of activity the person is doing. Um, so that's one very, very big limitation. Now let's get to what does this data actually mean? 
This isn't the actual neurons firing, right? This is this postsynaptic electric activity that's going on there. Um, there's theories, a lot of theories, so we don't really have time to get into that right now. Um, but it's not very accurate, right? We can't say these, these sort of things and say, oh, this is attention, this is relaxation, are a bit biased in my opinion. Um, and I guess at works about this data, it's very noisy. You can't move, right? It doesn't go well at all with movement. Uh, eye blinks are a very big problem. And consumer sets that have these dry electrodes, I would love to be proven wrong, but I have not seen anything that I'm convinced is more than noise. So very big problem. Um, and this is, I guess, the difference. You can see, like, when we do experiments in universities, this is sort of what a person looks like with gel, and we comb their hair for half an hour, and, you know, they're telling me, oh, this little, nice, cute little thing can do the same thing. I don't know. Not convinced yet. Uh, there are interesting things that we might get from this, right? We can get, again, this mus muscle, muscle activation. Uh, it's very useful. Uh, so we might be able to get that. And under certain conditions, you might find things that can be used for this brain-machine interface. We have a scientist that might, um, you might want to talk to her later. Uh, but the technology isn't quite there yet, in my opinion. Yeah, and these are uh, two different companies that are sort of trying to combine all these things that we talked about together. Um, so NeuroSky has a lot of their combining. They have this shirt that you wear that picks up your cardio and uh, gloves that picks up your movement, uh, and also um, some sort of EEG sensors. And the same with this, uh, uh, I emotion thing. Um, so these things are out there and hopefully they will develop, but um, I'm much more interested currently in the other data that's really easy and accessible for us to use. Um, so finally, in conclusion, really, um, if you want to remember sort of the key points when you're thinking about VR, keep thinking about what in this experience correlates to what your brain already knows versus what is new. How are we combining these new information streams together? Is this something that your brain is used to or is this something totally novel? Because this is the key and this is the power of VR. We can do things that are completely novel. Um, and with bio, biometric uh, data, we're gonna get so many more possibilities to combine into this magical, imaginary world. And we really, really do need more research. Um, and uh, if you wanna support this type of research, then um, yeah, talk to me, look at our Patreon. Uh, map, mapping augmented, oh, sorry, mapping aggregated platform. It's a combination of blockchain with augmented reality and location-based services. Uh, so here is Arnaud Everybigo, and please introduce yourself. Thanks, Micah. Um, so yeah, so as Micah said, my name is Arnaud Dason. Um, I usually come to these meetups to talk about VR, uh, but today I won't talk about VR. Uh, I've been, it's a bit about myself and then what we're working on. So I started out in gaming. Um, I worked in games uh, for console, PC, mobile, across about almost a decade. Uh, and almost two years ago, I started a company called AdVR, which focused on um, content advertising and analytics for VR and AR. Uh, So today I want to talk about like a project that, that we're working on to kind of enable AR to be uh, successful at the next level for everybody. So uh, we're building something that we call the Mapping Aggregation Platform, uh, which essentially is a decentralized uh, 3D uh, anchoring map for the world to allow persistent shared uh, experiences in augmented reality. So when we were working uh, in VR and at VR, uh, it was really easy to place content, right? You get a, you get a coordinate system, uh, you place your content there, you're done, finished, easy. But in AR, that changes. Um, the world around us doesn't have a coordinate system yet, uh, and it means that all of the AR experiences we have are essentially based off of what the device perceives and nothing else, uh, which leads to weird situations like Pokemon on airplane wings instead of um, in the seat next to you. Uh, and it pretty much makes it impossible to have a shared experience uh, without a lot of setup and calibration and synchronization between devices. <laughs> so why is it so hard? That's not me, by the way. <laughs> um, 
for why it is so hard, we've got to kind of look at where mapping is today. That's a pun. But uh, essentially, if you look at the current technologies that we use for positioning, we essentially use satellite for almost everything, uh, which is great. It works almost everywhere, but the uh, accuracy leaves a lot to be desired, right? We, um, the GPS or GLONASS, the two GPS systems, uh, we essentially only can get as accurate as five meters, uh, and that degrades really rapidly uh, in urban environments or any kind of uh, environment with trees or any kind of overhead coverage. Uh, we started leveraging device information like compass and Wi-Fi access points in the nearby area to improve that uh, accuracy, but it's still um, too coarse for what we need in augmented reality um, and for other uh, location-based contexts. And if we look at mapping, it's a big reason why. So the pipeline for mapping information today essentially uh, flows slowly through uh, starting with satellites or drones and planes that essentially do uh, aerial surveys of the, of the world around us, as well as street view cars that drive around our streets. Um, all that information gets amassed, processed, uh, eventually shipped to a mapping provider like Google or Apple. Uh, by the time you actually see um, mapping information on your map, it's been weeks if not months. It also has no indoor information. Essentially, we're using mapping technology that was developed decades ago. Uh, and for the applications that we need to empower for augmented reality, uh, that really doesn't apply anymore. We need an accurate mapping system. So that's where we bring in the idea of map. So essentially with map, what happens is we look at uh, consumer devices that are emerging in the market today. So you think of devices like the new uh, iPhone with AR kit, um, Google's Project Tango and AR Core, uh, the HoloLens, the, uh, the structure sensor from the that we just saw. All those devices can start gathering depth information about the world around them. So with map, what we do is we take those perspectives that are individual views of the world and we line them all together to uh, identify which features those devices uh, see in common. So essentially we take uh, the point cloud or the generated depth information that they provide and we identify features in the data set. And then we cross-reference all those features with every data set of the same space and that allows us to generate um, an anchoring layer built off of those key points um, that are sourced from every device and allows for essentially a shared understanding of the space around us. But that's not enough, right? Like, if I show you this map, um, can anybody tell me what this is? But if I show you that same map with even just a little bit of information, it becomes almost clearly obvious that I was showing you a picture of Las Vegas, right? Um, because maps without information are essentially useless. They tell you where you are, but not what's happening around you in the context that you're actually in. So on the map platform, because we now have this digital representation of what the world looks like, it allows for people to embed digital information into precise physical space, um, which leads to much more uh, aware and intelligent location-based services. So overall, these uh, key features allow for the following four things. Um, one, the map is always up to date because it crowdsources from consumer devices and consumers go everywhere compared to street view cars or drones or satellites. These key points allow for devices to localize themselves extremely accurately. So now these devices um, literally understand the world around them and seeing where they are in relation to that gives them some meter accuracy to the point that AR experiences can be consistent and reliable. We're building the map platform on a blockchain um, for a couple big reasons. Uh, first off, there's no source of truth when it comes to what the world around us looks like in a digital format. Essentially, we need to ask the crowd what the crowd sees and achieve consensus on what they see. So we use the blockchain to essentially um, achieve consensus and reward the people who contribute information to that platform. Um, but the map is essentially an open community project. So the map is available for everybody to read, access, and add information to. Which adds a very interesting feature as well, because now that everybody can aggregate and share their information onto the same platform, it means that information on the map becomes interoperable. It means if you're uh, Walmart, you're creating, say, an indoor map of your store, you can make that information available immediately 
on a blockchain that is now uh, able to be leveraged by any other application that wants to supplement your information. So if you're a retail store, um, traffic sensing systems, etc., all that information is immediately shareable to other applications that want to read your data. This allows for a safe once, read everywhere mechanism, which essentially allows you to go to one place we need to update your information and propagate it to, across all the services that might leverage your uh, product as a third party service. So what does this enable? Um, so first off, obviously, any location-based services and applications like augmented reality, um, which need this kind of information to function. It also enables uh, autonomous drone and vehicle pathing. Uh, we're not talking high up in the sky, because it turns out there's not that many depth features up in the air. Uh, but we actually don't really care about things at that height. We care more about what is, what is a drone going to hit when it's flying in urban environments? Where does it need to land? Is that information still up to date? How do we update it? So um, this provides essentially the um, important components of like the first half mile and last half, last half mile in autonomous vehicle uh, and drone navigation. We're not replacing the sensors on the device. We're augmenting their understanding of the world around them. It also leads to uh, powerful indoor, indoor mapping and uh, online to offline activation opportunities where uh, marketing uh, and retail information can be provided literally at a fingertip uh, to any device in a consistent manner. So I touched a bit upon this, but why does this need to be decentralized? Um, so essentially for us, it broke down to four major things. Um, first off, we need to source this data from everybody because only everybody goes everywhere. We need to validate through consensus, like I mentioned before. And we can all have a shared ownership of what the digital world looks like to us, which is really important because historically this information has been centered into like major companies. If you look at Wi-Fi positioning, where you cross-reference access points around you and their GPS location to where you are, all that information is siloed to two or three major companies, and they're the ones who benefit everything. Instead, um, using a platform that rewards data contributions essentially allows network ownership to be provided to people who contribute their information in a um, fashion that's based off of how much they're contributing and how much of that data is valid. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Joe, if you're around, could you, uh, could you come back up here for a second? We're gonna, the Dulce is going to go next. Um, her slides are absolutely ready. Let's see. What's this? Here we go. So Dulce is the CEO of River Studio. Hi, guys. <laughs> Hello. Your slides are right here. Okay, so I am going to talk about, um, I'm going to touch on everything that was just spoken about now. Um, everybody's focused on today, now, what products are out there, how can we leverage them, how can we utilize them, in how we're building for AR, VR, and XR, mixed reality. I want to talk about future and the ethics of it all and the standards that needs to be put in place and what does that mean when we move forward as a human race into this new world that's going to be completely sensing you and delivering content to you on the fly, and you're able to think of things and they happen. So um, the overview of my discussion is uh, to talk about the standards, obviously, so what the AR, VR cloud will be like and what how it will interact with the IoT cloud, um, how to make the hardware low cost and, and easy to use and fashionable and make people really want to use the hardware. And then how the software and platforms are low barrier to entry, more like turnkey solution curves. Um, the ethics curving where we're heading towards the singularity. If we don't get ahead of the singularity right now, it could definitely be a detriment to human society. Um, so we need regulations and laws to be put in place. We need to get ahead of AI and to utilize AI in a way that helps us and doesn't 
uh, hurt us. Uh, there was a video that just went around about swarm bots, these drones that will pinpoint people and directly kill them, and, and it was, uh, it was a, a tale, a cautionary tale, to try to get ahead of this technology that we're creating. You know, if we create a whole hive of, of robots that go out with the directive, you know, how do we control that? How do we guarantee safety and, um, and, and the spaces in which humans can live in conjunction with our technology in a very healthy way? We need to place humanity at the center of this technology and we need to understand that opting in and consent is really important. Um, then going into AI and mixed reality and how the biosensors, how uh, will read us in a mixed reality world, how the AI will become a more of an assistant for us, and how we will become um, an extension. AI is an extension of us, an age and a surrogate of sort. And then using the AI as a tool or as a um, assistant in coming up with new concepts and having the AI then interpolate those concepts for you so that you don't really have to do all the work. The AI is just, you give it a, a seed of an idea and it will interpolate that idea for you. And then I want to talk about the future of AI and humanity and AI babies and guardians. Um, I'll get to that a little, in a little bit. So mixed reality standards. Um, so we need to come up with a standard for our AR and our VR cloud. And I know that there are people out there that are really working hard to make that a, a reality right now. Um, we have Mozilla is working on a XR um, platform and standard, as well as um, the W3C. They have a uh, mixed reality consortium group. It's very small. You should all join it. Um, I think. Right now is the time to think about these high-level concepts, not allow our technology to just kind of roll along without have stepping back and having these thoughts of how do we make AR and VR something that's going to be filtered across the world. And in my understanding and the way I think the way um, AR and VR will uh, become like that layer is through the IoT cloud. Everything's going to be sensing you. Everything's going to be communicating. Everything's going to be connected. So where does AR and VR cloud mix with the IoT cloud? And then how does it become that mixed reality cloud? How are we walking through the world and switching back and forth between the real world or an AR experience or getting completely immersed into a VR experience? What does that world look like? Are we going to be walking around and seeing people just turn off like that and still move through the world seamlessly and in, in lockstep with everyone, but they are not experiencing the same reality that you are at that moment? And they can switch in and out of that. How does that work? You know, you have stories like Black Mirror where people are walking in the world and they can block people and they have all these black figures standing around them because they've blocked everybody. Where is that ethic happening? Um, so how, how do we make these three things work together in a way that really helps us? So um, going, heading into the ethics, um, you know, we have the singularity where Moore's law is driving us towards a time where we're going to think of an idea and that idea will manifest in front of us. Where does that leave us on a biological level? if we are messing with physics in that way. Um, it's, it's interesting, because you know, a lot of things are gonna start coming into play. So we really have to think deeply about these things now before it runs away with us. So rules and regulations and laws really need to be thought up um, that, have, that make sense, that are not abusive. Um, Maybe right now is the best time to think about a new version of the internet because of net neutrality. We have the telecoms, they're holding all that data in very centralized areas. It's beautiful that we have maps talking about decentralized mapping. We have Decentraland talking about a decentralized virtual environment. Let's have a decentralized internet. Let's think of how we can come up with a way to provide um, this information, this, this experience level to people and give it to them in, a, in, a, in a, a way that they can filter it themselves, give them the agency to filter it themselves, not have some conglomerate tell them this is the kind of content you, you're supposed to be having. 
then having humanity in the center of it all. I think that's the most important thing. If we don't keep humans in the center of our technology, we will lose our humanity. We have these amazing bio biological bodies. We can use these biological bodies in ways that, you know, mech can't be used in those ways. Or even synthetic robots. And we're not there yet. I don't even think we'll get to the point where a synthetic robot will be so exact like a human within our lifetime. But I feel that we can get to these elements in our lifetime. So if we keep the humanity at the center of technology, I think we'll be better off on a whole. Um, then understanding that machine learning and AI pay, play a pivotal part in how mixed reality is served up to us. Um, having an AI and machine learning in a way that is very personalized, very tailored, very uh, customizable for the user, um, but also understanding that there's a huge social dynamic going on also. Everybody will have that ability. So how do you keep people engaged with each other if they're able to uh, manipulate their environment in this way on such a high level of, of what they're receiving and how they're engaging with people. And then of course, there's opting in and consent. And this goes along with everything, with, for everybody. So right now, um, you know, there's a huge issue with all the cameras out in the world taking photographs and images of everybody at every point in time Who's really consenting to all of this? Who's really opting into all of this? It's the wild, wild west in that sense. Um, so I think giving people the ability to hide in plain sight or to step out of the space that is sensing them for a moment to not be sensed will be very important for humanity's well-being in the future. So when you have mixed reality in artificial intelligence, Obviously, humanity is at the center. Being able to biosense humanity and identify those people is at the center. Sensing them, giving them filters and controls and blocks would be very key. The ability to use AI as a surrogate, um, as an agent, a representation, and that AI could be a mech, it could be a hologram, it could be a 2D character, it could be a chatbot, it could be a disembodied voice, whatever it may be, but it represents you and it gives you the ability to have that surrogate out in the world. Having the AI as a creative assistant as well, so um, having a team of AI helping you build things, you know, 3D printing or creating virtual worlds or interpolating environments that you really want to create. Um, one project that I was working on um, at a hackathon at MIT last year was to recreate memories with uh, uh, VR. And one of the ideas that we were tossing around is having AI be able to go in and based off of images and video that you have on your social media, interpolate and create a world for you to step into whenever you want to remember a situation. You want to go back to when your child was born or the last time you had a talk with your grandparent or whatever maybe your wedding day of graduate, you can recreate this, AI will allow you to do that. I think that would be a real important health factor moving forward in the future. And then of course it's all run by blockchain, all completely uh, based on the blockchain and giving people the ability to control their IP and have their information. Almost done? Yeah, okay. almost done. All right, so the future, AI babies. I, <laughs> I would love to see a world where every human that's born in the world is assigned an AI mirror of themselves. So they, when their human baby is born, an AI baby is born, the AI baby is installed with wisdom, chaperone abilities, very wise child. But this AI baby would also be growing with the person and be a mirror for that person and eventually become the end of life agent that moves that person into immortality because the AI agent will still exist on even after the person's gone. Um, I think it'll help in our world of little emperors where we have one child um, scenarios. You'll actually be able to give a child a sibling without giving them a new physical sibling. It also helps in the loneliness and, and you know, lack of companionship that a lot of people are feeling and will probably feel even more 
when you can filter out the world, if you can block people around you, you're going to really be alone. So um, if you can have some kind of companionship that helps you, a, a guide, um, an imaginary friend, or a guardian angel moving you through the world, I, I think that would be optimal. So thanks, guys. If you want to know more, just email me. Awesome. Thank you. And, um, we have another laptop for the slides for our last talk. Uh, I go ahead and close this laptop real quick. Hand this over. So you can just reintroduce okay. yourself. Hi guys, I'm back again, this time for the best. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Is it connected? Can you see it? Yeah. 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 Awesome. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm Mert, I'm working for Occipital, and today I'm going to introduce you to our immersive mixed reality headset called Bridge. You can see it right here. So on Bridge, I talked uh, about that already. On the top of it, you have uh, an object called the structure sensor, and the structure sensor is going to build a 3D mesh of your environment before the actual mixed reality experience. You have the wide vision lens, I talked about that already, I'm not going to give you the same twice. And now let's look what it looks like. So we have this small video. So all the processing during this video is made directly on the phone. There is no like cloud processing, and you can see our small robot called Widget interacting with the real world in a very um, immersive way. Like you can see, the ball is bouncing on the couch, for example. Like you can feel the couch, you know the exact position of the couch. You can even like open some walls and doors for you, like this. But I think the most important point about that is like. Bridget, the robot, is actually evolving in the world in the same way that you guys could evolve in this world. So let's go back to some screenshots of our video. In the first one, you saw that Bridge, Bridget is actually able to navigate through the object without touch, touching anything. And basically, it can move from a point A to a point B like a video game character. On the second, at the top image on, the, um, on your right, you can see that it's, it's actually the shader effect I was talking about before. As you know where all the objects are, you can like add all this shader effect from video games directly onto it. But we can also use Bridget, use a bridge, sorry, to make like a safer VR experience. Let's say you are in the VR world, you are using Bridget, so you scanned your environment before, and you are maybe getting a bit overexcited, so you are getting too close to the table. Then you can like have a, a shader effect warning you, be careful, there is an actual real world table here, and if you get closer, you are going to get hurt by this table. So all of that, as I said before, is processed using the structure sensor. So the structure sensor used like a structure light technology to be able to build a 3D mesh, and it looks like that. So building a mesh is taking like between 10 and 30 seconds according to the mesh size, and you are just like scanning your environment. And from this scan process, you can have this result. So you can actually see the mesh on your left, it's a very detailed mesh. You can like get an OBG from that, for example. And it's this mesh which is going to allow Bridget like to do the navigation, the occlusion process, and all of that. For example, you can see the first, the four uh, pictures on the bottom. It's actually called uh, occupancy map. So it's slices from the mesh taking at um, a, a specific height. And it can give uh, Bridget the robot a sense where it can go and where it can't go. So let's say you want to build a robot which is a bit higher than Bridget. You can take um, this occupancy map a bit higher, and then a robot knows he's not able to go there because there is an actual object there. So I would say the key features from Bridge is like it's a very it's um, enabling you to use 
real world physics and real world occlusion into your mixed reality experience. It's also allowing you to have like a high frame rate and uh, a low jitter because we use like the last uh, predicted, predictive rendering uh, technology. And uh, Bridget is also like an open, open source robot so you can like build on all these new features and like use that in your own uh, mixed reality experience. So yeah, if you have any question, you can send them to my program manager or ask me during the panel. Thank you guys.